All right, three, two, one. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest, someone who I talked to back in 2018. His name is Fred Gianelli. We uh, discussed his his involvement with the band Psychic TV, but he was <laughs> sending messages to me on YouTube uh, wanting to talk. So I reached out to him and said, was see if he was interested in kind of going over his life in the band, but also considering the passing of Genesis P. Orge in 2020. So we're just going to kind of have a, a conversation about that. So Fred, are you there? I'm here. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for agreeing to the interview. It's been a strange year, but uh, for people yeah, who don't, <laughs> yeah, for people who don't know you, can you talk a little bit about yourself and your story about how you met Genesis P. Orge and moved to London and, and travel with the band? Uh, All right, so so I was a, just a producer, sound guy, recording engineer, musician in Boston. And in 1984, I was involved with this loft space with a bunch of art students in Boston, uh, 23 Stilling Street. And um, some of the students were involved in the Mass Art uh, Event Works Festival. It was kind of like an art festival. And they invited Psychic TV to perform a video work on Easter Sunday in 1984. So they came over a couple of weeks early to uh, plan their performance. It was just two guys, Genesis Purge and uh, John Gosling. And uh, they were, it was primarily going to be a video and tape loop um, performance. So... We were we were hanging around for like a couple of weeks, and they were planning their performance. I was at work in the recording studio, and then I'd come over at night, and we'd stay up all night talking and getting to know each other. And, and what uh, was, was were you kind of in that kind of environment, the occult environment, when you met him, or how did that? How did you guys have a meeting of the minds? Were you more uh, interested in a musical? I was definitely more interested in music stuff. I mean, you know, as far as the occult stuff, I mean, that, Jimmy Page had a big involvement, influence, I think, in America, uh, much more than, you know, earlier um, in the 70s, you know. So I think, um, I think the whole Led Zeppelin popularization of Aleister Crowley and Jimmy, Crow, uh, Jimmy Page's interest in it definitely – was a bigger influence than uh, you know Jen at that in, in the seventies. <laughs> in the seventies, right? Yeah. And were were you interested in their style of music at that time? Is that what kind of? Uh, I had I had some Throbbing Gristle records, but I wasn't a huge fan. I mean, I was just you know curious about uh, how they survived because their records were not very. They weren't very. Uh, you know, sales oriented or publicity, you know, they didn't attract a, they didn't tour in America. They never right. toured in America. Um, they were more associated in the art world. So it was just kind of interesting how, um, you know, they was able to keep going. I mean, Throbbing Gristle was very, I knew Sleazy was in hypnosis and he had a lot of, uh, you know, music business, uh, day job work. Right. Doing music videos and record sleeves and stuff. But Jen, he was just kind of like peculiar. Um, what was uh, Peter Christofferson like in person? He was very, very pleasant. Uh, and 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 I, I remember when we I met him at the very last performance of Coil, which was in Montreal. And a friend of mine was driving up and I wasn't going to go. It was a big festival, and they were kind of like the headlining act. And um, so I got dragged up there to meet Sleazy. So I'd never met him before, and this was in the 90s, I think, late 90s. And um, so we go up there, and uh, I finally uh, got introduced to him, and then we started chatting, and it was just all gossiping about Jen. And just right. laughing, you know, it's just like two old friends. Like we, we, 
it felt like you're chatting to an old friend when you meet a, a friend to a, a mutual friend of Jen's. <laughs> right. So, so, so when he said goodbye to me, he gave me a big bear hug. He was, he was really into these big bear hugs, you know. He gave me a big bear hug and he, he whispers into my ear, I feel like I know you so well. <laughs> I mean, just from your experience. Um, he he was a super intelligent guy, wasn't he, Christopherson? Yeah, he was he was pretty pretty uh bright and he was very interested in the occult also, you yeah. know. Right. And so, but the, that was post gen. So in the mid eighties, what was that music scene like and what brought you to want to go to the UK and join Psychic TV? Okay, so so by eighty four, Jen and Sleazy had split up. Okay. So Psychic TV really didn't exist. They had done two uh, albums in the UK, and they were both on uh, this label, Sun Bazaar, but they were distributed by major labels. One was Warner Music, and uh, I forget the other one. But they two big labels, two major labels. And uh, so they had a budget to record uh, with this uh, guy, uh, Hugo Zuccarelli, who did holophonic recording. And it was a very innovative technology of uh, recording with a binaural head. Um, and he he was an interesting guy. He went he he was an Italian guy from South America who went to England to show off his invention. And right off the bat, Paul McCartney wanted to buy it because it sounded so cool. And he didn't want to sell it, so he did some recording and he and he got. Uh, in touch, uh, Psychic TV got in touch with him and they hired him to record the albums. So then he that was kind of like the demonstration of holophonic recording. And then Pink Floyd hired him to do some work uh, for one of their albums. I think it was called The Final Cut. And, um, and so, you know, ho holophonic recording was a very uh, innovative. Um, technology that was used binaural technology that was used to record those things so after those two albums uh jen had a falling out with um sleazy and so sleazy left with the his boyfriend jeff and they and jeff had already started coil and so sleazy devoted his full time uh, energies to coil and in fact when when uh jen was in boston visiting us uh he he was talking to his wife on the phone and she told him that um sleazy and jeff had not decided not, that he could have the name psychic tv and they weren't going to fight over it you know uh, interesting jeff was john balance too right john balance yeah he used a bunch of names yeah I mean, different names yeah. yeah um but what was it what was it like what drew you to want to go join Jen in in the UK and you were how long were you with Psychic TV? So let's see. I I, I met Jen in '84 and uh, we talked a lot about music and and stuff. You know, uh, I was not interested in his cult uh, thing, his Temple of Psychic Youth cult thing at all. And um, so yeah, I just I was I was planning on making a record. And then the following year in 1985, I made that record with the, some musicians from Boston, this girl, Asako, and my friend Neil Sugarman. He later went on to have quite the career with um, Sharon Jones and, and the Dap Kings. And uh, right. he, he worked with Amy Winehouse. And he worked with a lot of famous musicians, Al Green and the Stax guys. And so he was he's, he's still working hard with Daptone Records. Yeah, I think so, we talked yeah. about him last time, yeah. Yeah, so so it's me, Asako Neil, and I made this record. I went over to England to cut it, and Jen offered to put it out, so I became an artist on Temple Records. It was like the seventh release. And then I did another record, and then in 19... What was it? 86, I come up with this arrangement of Are You Experienced, this Jimi Hendrix song, and I had met... Uh, Jen's daughter caress in 1985 in in London and she was this cute little girl I don't know if she how she must have been about three baby back then and she had this really funny uh, voice so I asked Jen if she would recite the words on the uh, record and he said yes 
but it took like another two years before we got around to doing it. Gotcha. And um, so then I was invited over in 88 and that's when I went over to England and I recorded primarily as to record our experience, but then um, they were putting together another compilation called uh, techno acid beat. And that involved all the friends of Psychic TV. There were tons of people. Um, Dave Ball from Soft Cell was one of the most important guys musically. His wife, Ginny Ball at the time. Um, myself, I did a track. John Gosling did a track. Jen did a track. You know, a lot of people were involved. So that was kind of another compilation of uh, people, everybody going in doing one song. Gotcha. And that became Techno Acid Beat, which was the follow-up to Jack the Tab. And so was that, would you call that uh, like early house music? How would you define that style? Uh, it's kind of like inspired by the acid house scene and techno scenes of Chicago and Detroit. I mean, the thing is, in 1988, in the, su in the early summer, it, it, is, it was starting to really explode in England. And... I'm an American guy going to London and I'm hearing these records for the first time and they're American records and they're all low tech recordings from Chicago. <laughs> and those are the coolest records. And I couldn't even buy them in Boston. You know, everything was very regional back then. It wasn't like the internet today where everything goes worldwide instantly. It was very slow for a piece of vinyl to travel across the world. I bet. I bet. I it mean, would take were... up, you know, a year. It took years. Those records were made in '86 in Chicago, and they didn't make an impact in London until 1988. Wow. So, what? Uh, how did that? What did you see? What did you see when you were true tour? You guys toured mainly around the UK. Is that correct? Well, no. In '88, um, so I, I did that recording, and I was planning on just hanging out all summer. And it was a really cool summer to hang out. And I knew uh, some friends over there. Uh, and then I became friends with Jen's crew, you know, his roadie, Richard Dawes, the drummer, Matthew Best. And they all seemed to like me. So Jen had a U.S. tour in 88 for the end of the summer in August. And uh, he was kind of trying to figure out what to do about it, what to do with the band, because the band was kind of um, – uh, you know, not really together. So I offered, I offered my production services and said, I can program a, a sampler to, and sequence it to do all this, you know, bass lines and basic drum patterns. And then you can play on top of it. And he said, okay, let's do that. And uh, it cut down on a lot of people. Like I think we got rid of three people by doing that. Gotcha. So it would be much easier to, to take the children on the road, fit in a bus um and he got he shed some musicians and then you know used me instead and and then we went off to denver we flew off to denver and rendezvoused and we started the tour and it just seemed started to work <laughs> nice how many stops did you guys have in 88 oh we probably did 30, over 30 gigs oh wow yeah it was a national tour i mean we went up to um you know we did canada we in 88, we didn't go to Mexico, but we we did all of uh, U.S. and Canada. And then in 1990, we did it again in the spring. And that was uh, – we did Mexico also. We went down to Tijuana. Oh, interesting. What are you doing? Mo mostly like college venues or what type of venues were you? Oh, all sorts of venues. Some, some were like theaters. Some were ballrooms. Some were clubs, small clubs. Some were big clubs. Some were, you know – Outdoor amphitheaters, it all depended on the city and how popular we were. And it seemed to really work. I mean, we had a lot of deadheads out west who started liking us because we would play a long time, like sometimes two to three hour show, and they would like to dance a lot. So, so what would you call your main kind of crowd for... for Oh, we were probably underground alternative industrial scene, you know, post-industrial scene. Gotcha. And what was that like? Was he, was Genesis P. Orge, was he involved in kind of his transhumanism at that time? Was he trying to change his body? Uh, not really. I mean, he was, he had already been into piercing, so he had all the piercings and he was kind of a counter-cultural figure because 
uh, this book publisher in San Francisco, uh, Vale, did this book called Research. And at the time, in the in the mid '80s, uh, there was this um, issue. It was kind of a paperback issue book called uh, Modern Primitives, and that was really a uh, very popular and in, instrumental in in, in uh, disseminating awareness about body piercing, which I thought Jen was going to get in trouble for. Because this is during the AIDS era, and I thought anything you know anything with blood is going to be bad, you know, popularizing that. Right. It and turned now, out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, now it's very commonplace. You know, everybody's right. getting right. their genitals pierced or whatever. Right. Sure. That's but at the time you. when Sleazy brought that into the psychic TV um, world by, via the gay underground. So it was kind of more popular in the gay world. And then, um, you know, Jen kind of introduced it into the hetero world. And was he married at the time? Yeah, he was married to Paula, yeah. Right. And then he had children. And uh, what kind of – do you remember any, like, road stories or anything peculiar or interesting about his antics? Uh, well, he used to go around saying that he invented Acid House, which was – you know, we would all look at each other like, oh, brother. <laughs> yeah. Because he's talking to, like, you know, white uh, rock uh, journalists, so-called journalists. And he was just, you know, lying. So he became we, he became known as, like, a, um, uh, a congenital liar. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> like, he would exaggerate a lot, you know? Interesting. So. And, and so then... Um, I mean, that seems to, to kind of be something that was part of his personality. What uh, what led? How long were you together with him and Psychic TV? So, if it was eighty eight, I was in the band, and then by ninety two, ninety three, I was. You know, it was funny. The reason why we're we're doing this interview is because I still get harassed by his fans, because he goes around telling he's he had been going around telling people for years since the 90s that the reason why I got fired from Psychic TV is because um, I punched out his daughter, <laughs> oh, which is which is so absurd. And I'll tell you the details of this story. Okay. So so he had been run out of England. He, he went from Nepal to California. And we covered some of this in the last interview. Right. And uh, so he was staying with Michael and Cindy Horvitz. And I flew out to San Francisco. We did a uh, we did a show out there, a small show at uh, the Floppy House, the Flop House there. And then we drove down to Los Angeles, and we were going to meet Timothy Leary on the radio station on our friend Bob, Don Bull's radio show on Mars FM, which is uh, that was in Santa Monica. And so we go down there, and Tim comes over, and we meet Timothy Leary for the first time because Michael had uh, spoken to him, and, and Tim invited us over to stay uh, because his wife had left him, and he was lonely. So we, we went down to keep Tim company and meet each other for the first time. So we meet on the radio show, and, uh, and that was pretty funny. And then I ended up staying on the radio show and DJing a lot. And then this friend of Don Bulls offered me to stay at his house. And I'd have my own room. And he would offer me a car to drive around. And you would have laughed at the car. It was like this little little shitbox car. It was painted black. And it had like all these like satanic <laughs> symbols on it. I'm like, oh, great. A marked car <laughs> in L.A. <laughs> So I was staying down in uh, West Hollywood, and then I drive over to Tim's house every day up in Beverly Hills. You know, right? And he kind of had like a salon, right? Didn't he have people coming and going? Yeah, he had people all visiting the all the time. Yeah. yeah. So, so the house was never empty, and um, and I would spend you know all day and night there, and then I just sleep at this other house. What was so, your impression uh, of Leary? Well, you know, Tim, well, we were both from Massachusetts, so we had that in common. And 
the funny thing about Massachusetts, especially with people who are from Massachusetts and meet anywhere else in the world, they become instant friends. <laughs> Because we we all know how it's very kind of a cynical place. I don't know where you're from, but uh, well, Northern California, Georgia. Northern California, yeah, yeah. It's it's Which a is definitely its own place. Definitely its own. Yeah, culture. yeah, yeah. I mean, de Massachusetts ha has a lot of different areas to it, but you know, if you if you're from the Boston area, I can see why you know Hollywood has and people have so much fun making fun of Boston. <laughs> We do have a lot of student turnover, so I think that that helps spread the Bostonian attitude, you know. Right, makes sense. Yeah. He was still kind of healthy when you met him, right, uh, Leroy? Yeah, he, he was he was very sharp for he was seventy two, and and very sharp. He wasn't doing any drugs when I was around him. He was drinking a lot, um, and. He was way more interested in what we, you know, what we use in the internet right now. He was interested in computer nerd guys coming over talking about what the internet was going to be, because it was just kind of starting, you know. Right. And he was very, very, very focused on like uploading your consciousness, your writings, your music, your ideas, your stories onto the internet, and, and living through that, you know. Right. And I, I think mean, which is definitely happening now. I think that he cried, got his brain cryogenically frozen, if I remember. No, he, he didn't wind up doing that. But oh, okay. But as in terms of him seeing the potential of what the internet has become, he was absolutely one hundred percent correct, uh, yeah, and absolutely. very, very, you know, into it. And he really, he, 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 he was saying how like it was. He'd been waiting his whole life for this kind of thing. This is more psychedelic than psychedelia was, you know, in the psychedelic days. Interesting. Did you see so, any other notable figures at his place? So let's see. Well, let me tell you the story about how how Jen made up this lie about me and and decided okay. to start spreading okay, it. Sorry. So so Tim uh, said he was going out to dinner with. Um, uh, with uh, I think it was uh, Delight, the group Delight. So they were in town or something, and they were from New York. So they were in L.A., and so Jen and Paula uh, went out with Tim to go meet them. And I stayed back with the kids, and then I was going to go catch some more sleep. So I went. I was in Tim's office, and I called my friend Jonathan, who just happened to work at, at the New York City morgue. And I'm talking to Jonathan, telling the shit, and I'm, you know, I'm, just, hey, I'm here at Timothy Leary's desk, and I'm just, you know, just catching up, because I always talk to Jonathan. He was my friend. He was my main English contact my entire life, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm talking to Jonathan, and the phone is clicking, going berserk, because it's totally tap blind, you know. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> it's like the guy's still being monitored. You know? Wow, all the way. I bet. Yeah, he was the world's most dangerous man at one point. Oh, uh, Nixon. Yeah, he was Nixon's yeah. scapegoat. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, he's still the the phone was still going berserk. Like you could tell it was being recorded. You know. <laughs> That's funny. That's too much. So then I come out of the room and I say goodbye to Janesse, and she punches me in the balls. <laughs> so she had this habit of always punching me in the balls, because she take out all her frustration on me, and she was the youngest daughter. So I went back to this guy's house to crash, and I am just like in a fetal position all night. I'm like, she really got me good. So the next day I go back to the house, and there's like 30 people there, all these strangers. Uh, some people I knew, uh, but a lot of strangers I didn't know. And Janess, I go to say hello to Janess in front of the refrigerator, and she grabs my necklace and starts strangling me. <laughs> And she's in the arms of this woman. And so to get free, I tapped her on the, on the cheek and she started crying like I, screaming, bloody murder. So that that really pissed me off. That was like the last straw of like, oh. So I had a, I just like stormed out of the house and just was really pissed off because she was just, you know, setting me up to get to be a, to, to, to blame all her hardship with her life and her family on me you know and then i realized janess was a very very frightened child i mean janess 
when they lived in Brighton, Jen sent them to this um, school, which was kind of right next door to the house that they lived in. And it was a Christian school. And you can imagine the teasing she got from the, the, uh, the other students, you know? Right. So one I mean, day, how did how did he raise his kid? How did he raise his children? And what to be to be to be able to think for themselves? I think you know, in in a lot of ways, Jen was a, you know, an interesting father. I mean, he was definitely not suitable to provide for his family. That's for sure. He was always scamming his friends, and that's what he was doing with the band, as I la later learned. But you know, the school was apparently very good, and he was into being intelligent and standing up for yourself. And I, Janice, one time uh, Paula asked me to bring her to the school, and I didn't even know it was right next door, really. So I bring her over to the school, and she was terrified. And I, I never saw anyone so scared. And then I understood where Janice was coming from, and she just was having a horrible experience um, being harassed and bullied by all these um, Christian kids, you know? Right, interesting. How well the kids are now? What in their thirties or forties? Yeah, or I think so. Yeah. Did they take after their dad or what? How, how no, they they're oh. very normal. They're very. Uh, it's like, um, well, maybe Janice took after her dad more. But I remember when we were on the tour bus, we would always, you know, Paula uh, would tease. We'd say, "What are you going to be when you grow up?" And and Caress would, you know, was very sensible all always, and we. Paula would tease her and say, oh, Caress is going to be a secretary, <laughs> which is like the most normal thing you could be, you know. Right. But they, they were very together, and it was really – I thought it was very self-indulgent of Jen when he did get all that money off that Rick Rubin case to not send his kids to college and support them more, you know. Yeah, he got a substantial sum. Didn't he get a seven-figure sum or something like that? Yeah, I don't know how – yeah, it was – yeah, it was a, it was probably a little bit of an over a million. Yeah, when when was that? He supposedly fell out of a window during a. a yeah, that was after after he he uh, insulted me and and pretty much the band dissolved. So, so after that insult happened, was that a strategic maneuver by him to? Fulfill well, something? no. So th this incident in in uh, San Francisco, I mean uh, Los Angeles. You know, he, he did want to get rid of me, and I didn't even want to work with him anymore anyway. But then we still kept doing – he still kept inviting me out to San Francisco to do shows with just the three of us, me, Jen, and Paula. Gotcha. And, uh, and so we did that for a while, and then finally Paula said, I'm thinking – she told me one time – it, it, we were sitting in a car alone, and, and she said, I'm thinking of leaving Jen. And I was like, you know – I can't say I blame you one bit <laughs> because he put her, you know, he put her, he made her life so much difficult, especially for the kids. And he was, he was unable to provide for family, you know? So here they are living in, 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 in Northern California for, I don't know what, it was about a year, year and a half maybe. And then she decided to leave him. And then he was still, now he's really desperate and calling me all, you know, to, to help him out and to do things. And um, and that's when we ended up uh, getting an opportunity to make some demos for a big record label that Herb Albert owned called Almo Sounds. And so we did these demos, and um, and then we didn't get signed, uh, but but we submitted the demos, and then Jen sent me a contract, and he wanted all the money. He wanted two hundred thousand dollars. So he wanted me to be his partner, but he didn't want me to, to, to be a partner in sharing the money. Yeah, so he was like kind of a, using the band as kind of a financial scam. Is that what you said? Yeah, basically. Yeah, I mean, he was he. he we never examined the books. Paula did. Paula did the books, and uh, and in fact, when I think I remember her telling me she had she was separated from him and then uh she told me that he owes me money <laughs> oh, i said don't tell me how much because then i'll get depressed <laughs> so he was he he 
Yeah, I think I saw in one of his interviews he was always worried about paying rent and always stuff like that. He's kind of a hard scratch. Well, he was always, always like that, yeah. Like he was um, living above his means, you know. And did you see much occult stuff when you were with him, or had he written uh, the Psychic Bible yet? Uh, a lot of that stuff is a collection of earlier writings in the, from the early 80s. Like Jeff and Jeff Sleazy Monty wrote, wrote stuff. Other, you know, members of the Temple of Psychic Youth wrote their stuff. Interesting. Uh, oh yeah, here's this guy Graham is asking, do, do you know yep. about the accusation of sexual abuse by G, GPO? And I go, yes, I do. <laughs> Can you and talk I know, about that? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I'll tell you what I did. How I remember the name uh, Jackie Dillon. And I just knew in 88 I went there, and I was staying at 50 Beck Road, which is Jen's old house, where he originally settled with uh, Cozy from Thriving Gristle. Mm -hmm. And then when she left, then Paula moved in, and then he started his family, and they lived there in the early 80s. Then he moved up to um, uh, just north of there, a few miles up. And then he moved down to Brighton in the summer of 88 before we went on tour of the USA. And so Jackie Dillon, I knew of her because I was staying at 50 Beck Road a lot. And I, I'd heard about this little girl who heard voices across the road. And she heard voices in her head ever since she was a little girl. And then... Uh, that's the first time I ever heard of Jackie Dillon, never heard of her again, until we were in Los Angeles staying at Timothy Leary's house, and Jen and Paul were saying that they, they thought it was a Christian conspiracy to get them run out of England. And these born-again Christians had made this TV documentary, got it shown on Channel 4, Right. Uh, claiming that there was satanic child abuse and they have video footage of satanic child abuse occurring. And then they showed footage of promo videos by Psychic TV that were financed by a major label, Warner's, uh, Warner Brothers Records, I think was the one. It had uh, Mr. Sebastian uh, voice over of uh, a video of Derek Jarman talking dressed as a priest. And it was just totally ludicrous. And then they had this interview with this woman who called, she said her name was Jennifer and that she was um, impregnated. And then they performed an abortion on her. And then they used footage of Paula when she was pregnant. Hmm. Um, so it was just like, wow, these, these people are more sophisticated and deceptive. <laughs> Than Jen, because Jen, it's all kind of fake. You know, if there was any blood stuff uh, in a music video, which there was at the performance of, in Boston at Mass Art, it was like tons of fake blood. You know, it's like a horror <laughs> schlock film, you know. It was very obvious. But, but didn't he have, didn't Jen have a history of doing performance art with all kinds of yeah, it's but it, but it's just so it, it was just so minor and so obscure. Like it was so hard to see those films. Those films were never shown. So gotcha. it was very very underground. And there was these videos floating around of the Temple of Psychic Hughes first transmission. Um, <clears throat> you know they showed a lot of that in Boston when they were in Boston, but they they never did. You know it was just uh, it it was not popular. Uh, popularly shown, you know. Gotcha. And uh, <clears throat> so the so the accusation of sexual abuse is false. Is that what you're saying? So that well, that? yeah, Jen. I I am shocked that Jen didn't come right out and say this woman is insane. Um, because she hears voices. She does not. She's schizophrenic. She refuses to take medication. She's part of a whole movement. Uh that doesn't want to take medication. So I remember, um, yeah, Jack, this guy's dream is saying, Jackie has a detailed YouTube presence talking about hearing voices. Yes, and she's held up as a poster child 
of this of this uh, anti medication movement, which again is funded by Christians, because I know that she has come over to speak in Massachusetts, in Western Massachusetts, several times when she made her presence known to me, which was by attacking me on Twitter and making accusations about me and uh, the record I made with Caress, are you experienced, and saying that I was a pedophile or that Jen was a pedophile. <laughs> and then she just went off the deep end saying that he was a pedophile, pedophile, pedophile. And then I got into this war with them on Twitter and I thought they were all absurd. When did that, when did the Twitter flame war commence? Was that fairly that recent? Happened, yeah, that was about a couple of years ago. Maybe two or three years ago. So fairly recently. Interesting. Yeah. So it was all this bullshit. And then uh, she started this whole campaign and she was looking for more victims of this um, East London uh, pedophile group that was operating on Beck Road directly across the street from her. And it was completely, she couldn't get any other witnesses because it didn't exist. <laughs> it was all in her head. So it was pretty sad because she obviously had some serious trauma in her family. I don't know enough about, you know, why she lived on that street. I asked her if she knew the woman next door who was a famous artist, Helen Chadwick. If she knew the nice lady next door, she never responded. I mean, she was definitely off kilter. All her Twitter ranting was about politics and pedophiles and this and that and insanity. She got thrown off Twitter, banned for life, because she's crazy. This is her website, if you oh, see. Oh yeah, it there, yeah, yeah. There it is. Yeah, that's Jackie. Yeah, she's she obviously. Yeah. yeah. So I I learned about her. She came back into the woodwork when Cozy's book got published. And so her, a group of her people would go to Cozy's public book readings when she was – her book had just come out. And they started protesting Cozy's book, book things, and she was accusing Cozy of being part of this cult. Cozy left Beck Road a long time before Jen got married, you know? And, sure. and uh, so she's got – her timeline all confused. She has a lot of details and facts that she's learned about Genesis through books and published material. And she's piecing together a case, but it just doesn't make sense. If you knew the people, know um, the history and, and know the background of everybody. So it's kind of absurd. Well, so there's definitely some people, activists out there who have, in my opinion, have created a narrative, just like you said, just from what they could see on the Internet. Yeah, and yeah. Not add additional facts than what's known. I'm not going to mention their names, but it wouldn't yeah, be the well, first I've... time. Because they get attention. They also get a kind of street cred, like an Internet fringe conspiracy yeah. street cred. So, you know, they get attention. People give them money. I'm not. Su I'm surprised that they're not accusing Jen of being the adre adrenochrome uh, supplier <laughs> to the royal family. <laughs> I mean, that's how absurd it is. You know, oh, well, maybe yeah. maybe Jen was the adrenochrome supplier to the royal family, and when he well, had children, he decided to stop sacrificing children, and that's why he got run out of England. And did, uh, did, <laughs> did you ever see? I think it was a picture of Jen with the head of the OTO at that time. Do you ever meet that guy? His name was uh, not Breeze. It was, William uh, Breeze, yeah. Bill that was Breeze. William Breeze. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did yeah you we, know I he, met him in in Chicago in 1988. Gotcha. What did so you we think played about we played the gig in Chicago. Well, I mean, there's no clear OTO head of the OTO. You know what I mean? He's just right. No, it's a disputed. Yeah. Yeah. It's but so. It used to be, yeah. He's 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 one of the uh, uh, you know probably the 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 guy with the biggest ego who claims he's <laughs> carrying on the OTO. <laughs> there was I don't another know. another guy I've seen with Origin's name I can't remember offhand, but uh, it wasn't Bill Breeze. It was somebody else. Uh, it wasn't McMurtry. I'll have to find out this guy's name, but. Uh, I can't remember. Um, I mean, did you see any other occult figures around uh, Orge? 
let's say, well define a cult figure. I think it's all well, make believe. <laughs> okay. So you I mean, do you think that he put on his kind of that uh, orange was kind of like a, he was he was very loudmouth and and would talk about it. He'd brag a lot about it. But listen, if he was so connected in the occult world, all right, he should have been living a much more lavish lifestyle. If you if you sell your soul to the devil, you should be able to live high on the hog. And it was such a low budget operation. It was absurd, but the way he talked about it and how powerful it was, people I think considered him some some type of figure in that world. Right. But if yeah. you ask me, it's it's no more important. I mean, they're just as bad as like I grew up a Catholic. All right, they're just as bad as the Vatican with their rituals and their superstitions and their absurdities. It's like they're not grounded in. Uh, a reality. It's all mythological fantasy world for them. Uh, Breeze played with Psychic TV after you on three recordings. After me, yeah. yeah, right. yeah. The Fractured Garden, Cold Blue Torch, Trip Reset, Spatial Memory. So in the late 90s, um, the guy I was thinking about was David Tibet. Have you ever heard of David Tibet? I've heard of him, but he lived on Beck Road in the early 80s, but he was gone by the time I went over there in, in the 88. Because he was... He's he current 93, yeah. Yeah, he was de current 93, but definitely friends with Orange. He was given the name Tibet by Orange. Yeah, he, he, um, uh, Jen hated Tibet. Oh, okay. So they worked together on the, he was part of the crew in the second album, Dreams Less Sweet. And his photo is in on the inner sleeve, is included on the inner sleeve of that. But he was not a full time member of Psyche TV. And it, and he had started current 93 by then and had records out. And then I don't know enough about the falling out between uh, Tibet and Jen at all, but he Jen, Jen really slagged him off as he did Sleazy, as he did Chris and Cozy, as he did um, Jeff. You know, he, he, he just slagged off a lot of people that he yeah, used he to work with. So <laughs> I was well prepared for that when I knew he was going to, you know, flip someday. <laughs> the um, yeah, the uh, it seems like Tibet yeah has been around ninety three, but he's definitely an OTO member. So there's definitely more OTO members around around Orange for sure. Oh yeah, yeah. So. Um, I mean, but what what do you think the OTO does that is so scandalous that it's going to you know uh, change the world because. They're, everyone seems to be broke. If when I meet, they're them. broke and they're fighting each other. There's all kinds. They're all of, fighting each fight. other now. Yeah. They're like Christians. They all in fight. <laughs> well, um, I think now that there's a big. I heard some gossip about uh, Jimmy Page to own that uh, yeah, place in Scotland. Place, yeah, yeah, and um, and now it burnt down one Christmas, which is very <laughs> hilarious. So it's like yeah. this. Ruin of a of a mansion uh, up in Loch Ness. It's barely a mansion. It's really kind of like it, a little, yeah. It was just a house. It's, yeah, it's just a one story house. It just has the Crowley mythos involved in it. Yeah. So but there, there's a member of the OTO trying to rebuild that. I would yeah, say the OTO a group of them, a group of them who happen to be Nazis too. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's not surprising. But yeah, they're, it's yeah. a dysfunctional group. It's always been. Yeah. To a certain extent, if they're doing the rituals by themselves, that's a whole other story. But yeah. but it's so funny that s some o you know OTO or Crowleyite type Nazis are buying you know an, a ruin of of a of a sh of a shell of a building when you know Crowley was in Italy and he got thrown out by. <laughs> Fascist. Mussolini, yeah, no, yeah. it's interesting. And, and you know, he was he was like a personal fascist, and Mussolini was a big fascist, political yeah. fascist. You know? Yeah, yeah, no, probably would be very happy between... fascist. Yeah. It's just yeah, it's right. just absurd how I I I don't take any of those people seriously. So, um, are you willing to take a few questions from the 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 listeners? Sure, We're sure. Kind of like forty four minutes. Anybody have any questions for Fred? Anybody? Music questions, history questions. Anybody? Um, another people are mentioning the the 
Hoaxted or Hampstead hoax, which is another kind of case that I, I researched and couldn't find any evidence. So I do Ham believe that. You know, Hampstead, but, England? Correct. Oh, I don't know. Have you ever heard, about that? That? You ever heard no. the Hampstead hoax? No. It was a lady, a woman, and her boyfriend at the time. She was in a, a custody battle with her husband and just made up this thing about abuse that was taking place at the in Hampstead at the church and that it was all networked and everything, but there was really no evidence. They couldn't really dig up any evidence other than two kids who were videotaped being after being hit by a spoon talking about this. And to me it was just they were just reciting something. But it really tore or tore up the internet. But uh judges looked at it, some ex cops looked at the information. People analyze it and just like there was no corroboration. There's just yeah, the two yeah. but there are people with the preset sensibility that they're gonna root out this evil and they just jumped on this and started harassing people. And it, it was to me it just a giant hoax. But uh Yeah, well in, in England there was Operation Spanner, which was kind of a roundup of anyone who is gay that was involved in the um tattooing piercing s and m scene so operation spanner was an important thing and jen was um not part of that because he was had a wife and kids and was you know not uh part of that underworld but they rounded up school teachers and you know all these different people who had never met each other and tried to try them as a group yeah there you go operation spanner sure. yeah, I never and heard of yeah, see, this was an important uh, operation that the British government did to try to route out this stuff. And that's why I thought the, the piercing stuff would be much more hard to, to popularize in the U.S. Um, because of the AIDS uh, uh, epidemic happening. I mean, this is the early days of AIDS, you know, in the, in right. the mid-80s when I met him. And it was uh, Operation Spanner just wanted to eradicate all of them. And so I remember we did go, um, uh, the guy who did the piercing and the tattoos for Psychic TV, um, his name was uh, Mr. Sebastian, and he got round up. And he was, he, was, uh, he was tried at the Old Bailey, and we went down, and he was let off. But they ruined the guy's life. They took all his belongings, and then they charged him with uh, – illegally um, giving um, sedatives. So say you wanted your penis pierced. He didn't believe that you should have pain, and so he would give you a shot of Novocaine and would perform the operation, and uh, he got charged with uh, grievous bodily harm or something for, for applying anesthetic without a, a license. Fascinating. And what, well, there, were other, uh, there, were, there were other people who were involved in child molestation, teachers or something, and there's some serious offenders in that group. But the way they turned it into a whole operation and tried to try them as a group, as a you know, an entire list of all these different people, uh, was very, very um, you know, suspicious. And Jen was on that list, and they came after him after. Oh, interesting. So he was on it, but was Christopherson? He was Christopherson was kind of involved in that. Uh, he SNL. was he was part of that world, but he was not on the list. No, not he wasn't doing list. anything. He he got tattooed and pierced by Mr. Sebastian, but they wanted like you know more hardcore people who were in, heavily involved. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, anybody have any questions for the guest? Anybody uh, on YouTube? Anything? We're almost at 50 minutes. It went pretty fast. So uh, is there anything you'd like to add? Anything that you'd like to talk? I mean, we didn't really talk about Jen's passing. Do you, in the kind of, uh, through the grapevine, hear of anything about, did they have a cell, like a service or anything for him or any anything come out or any Well, they, I, I heard things uh, through the grapevine about them. I do know that on the day it happened, I saw Jen's manager, uh, popped up and, and announced I was on Facebook and I saw him pop up and we're not even friends. Ryan is not a friend of mine, but it popped up and his announcement came out that Jen had passed away. 
and I had just received a, an email from Cozy, and I said, oh, it looks like Jen finally, you know, kicked the bucket, and then we stopped emailing each other, and, and we never talked about it. She never made a comment. I've never really made a comment because to us, he he you know killed our friendship and he's been dead to us you know for many years so was cozy he was he dead to cozy as well yeah i mean especially after the throbbing gristle okay. reunion and how he ended oh. it i mean he was really messed up during throbbing gristle gotcha and she what what was in her book that was didn't she say some scandalous things about him in her book yes well the the big thing was as soon as the book it hadn't even come out yet and the Guardian published the first excerpt, and it was the most scandalous thing, which was that he dropped a concrete block from the balcony uh, at Monte Cazaza's house in San Francisco when she was staying there with him after they had broken up or something. I think Throbbing Gristle or maybe Jen and uh, Cozy and Sleazy was still doing cum transmissions, and then they were out in San Francisco before, you know, in the early days of Throbbing Gristle or Cum Transmissions, I'm not sure. So I am happen to be very good friends with Monty Cazaza now. And so I call up Monty and I leave a message and he calls me back and he's just laughing. He goes, what, what did they say? What did they say? And I go, what the hell is this story about this concrete block being uh, dropped down off the balcony and just missing Cozy's head? And he's, and he confirmed that story, and uh, they just never mentioned it. It was not. It was something that she held as blackmail against Jen wow. until she wrote her book, which was great because you know I would have never if 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 I met Jen in '84 and I had heard about the story about him dropping a concrete block on a woman's head, I would say, "Get the fuck out!" You know what I mean? I don't want to know you. Wow, fascinating. Did so, you ever? Yeah. So yeah. So there was some scandal there, but he I mean, he was definitely used when he passed away. There were all kinds of articles about uh, him. As I have a question from the audience, Roberta yeah. Glass True Crime Report says, "What does Fred think about Jen's plastic surgery to look like his wife?" I think it was a waste of money, and I think he should have put his kids through college. You know. Do you know if his kids are, do they have a fond memory of their dad or what's the situation after the, you know? I'm not sure. I don't really talk to them. Um, I do communicate with his ex-wife. Uh, but, you know, we don't, we, I don't have, you know, any interest in in uh, talking about Jen to his ex-kids. I'm sure they're confused and conflicted about it. You know, in some ways he was a really good dad. In a lot of ways he was a real jerk to a lot of people. <laughs> Here's another question. I don't know what it means. Does Fred think about the WMT and the Hollywood Rescue Crew? Oh, West Memphis know? Three and the West Memphis what's Three and the What's the uh, Hollywood uh, Rescue Crew? I don't know what that probably means. Johnny Depp and um, Peter Jackson and all those rich people that bailed them out. Oh. I mean, with my yeah, with my limited uh, interactions with uh, Damian Eccles, I think you know. The guy's lucky to be alive. Um, I don't think he did it, you know. But right. I, I haven't examined every single detail. But I'll tell you one thing, that Arkansas seems like a really messed up place that anyone can get railroaded doing things. Gotcha. Uh, we're almost at an hour here, Fred. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Do you have social media where people can reach out and contact you? Where can people see your music or listen to your music? Yeah, well, it's, you know, I don't make a living doing music anymore. I work at a hospital, and uh, we're dealing with COVID-19. Very exciting times. I think when COVID-19 started in March, I worked three and a half months, seven days a week rationing masks. And wow. it's, look, it's looking like I'll be doing that pretty soon again. So, so is it starting to ramp back up in, in Boston? It's, 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 yeah, it's, it's starting to double. Double well at each hospital, so it's it's getting, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel. There is a vaccine. There will be vaccines, but we just got to get through the next six months, I think. Six more months. Wow. Yeah. Um, great. And if anybody wants to reach out to you, you're on 
Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Twitter as the Kooky Scientist, I think. Kooky Scientist, that's right. Yeah. All right, great. Well, Fred, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Fred Gianelli, formerly of Psychic TV. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Ciao.